We'll take your Bibles and open them to Exodus chapter 25. And we are tonight going to look at verses 23 to 40, look at the table of showbread and the lampstand. Now, as I mentioned, you're going to see these chapters mirrored because Moses is describing it here. And then he's going to say, we're going to build it. And then he's going to go in several chapters and they're going to be building exactly what we're reading here. And they repeat these verses. So we won't reteach at that time. So sometimes, very often, people will just literally read uh, these chapters, like uh, eight chapters in a row. (laughs) And you'll see all of a sudden they go from chapter 21 to 28 uh, or something like that. And you're going, how did they do that in one night? often in, you know, 35 minutes. And it's because they're going to teach it when they get into chapter 35. That's when they're going to start breaking it down into its bits and pieces. But we're just sort of taking it this way. I I don't know why. Maybe next time we'll do it a different way. But um, we have in this early part of the chapter, we last time looked at the willing offering What a beautiful thing. And we're going to actually see them take the offering with a willing heart for that building project. And I'll tell you, I have taken as pastor at Calvary Chapel San Diego through several building projects. And each one of them was an amazing season, life-changing season uh, for the church. And and you'll find very quickly, there are willing hearts and there are not willing hearts. (laughs) And you really don't want... The, the provisions, the money, the fabric and the gold and the silver and, and, and whatever from people that aren't, don't have a willing heart. You, you don't want it. God doesn't need it to begin with. But then those of a willing heart. And there are people that amaze me who literally were praying for offerings. And God provided finances for them to give. And, and to see the Lord do it, you need a tremendous amount of money. Our last building was oh, well over 80,000 square feet, and it was a very experienced building. And, and uh, we weren't in a wealthy area. And, and anyway, make a long story short, I've just seen God move through this season. It's a wonderful season. I hope we as a church get to go through that season and see God provide a building for us. A building, uh, it, it is such a wonderful tool. And um, it does have such a a spiritual stronghold, especially in a a community. You know, when you think about it, and I've seen this many times with Calvary pastors, they're out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, New Mexico or Kansas, it doesn't matter. And there's this little hill. They don't even have mountains. There's this little hill, and they put, somebody puts a cross on it out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, you wonder if anybody ever sees it. You know, maybe two people a year driving out in the middle of nowhere. And the ACLU are suing people out of their mind to get those two little pieces of sticks down off that hill. Satan is going over. I mean, he's just hysterical trying to get that little cross off that hill out in the middle of nowhere. Now think about a building. (laughs) A whole building in the middle of a metropolis with a lot more than just a cross on it. But standing, yeah, it's a wonderful thing. I I do hope God gives us that season. But anyway, he said, guys, we're going to build a tabernacle. Well, he actually said a sanctuary. Now, the sanctuary would be be built much, much later with with Solomon. But the first uh, version of this would basically be a tent, a tabernacle. And it was very small, as we talked about. Next week, we're going to talk about it the whole time. And we'll, we'll lay out the, the parameters and, and where everything is, and so you can see it. Last week, we talked about the most important article in that temple, which is the Ark of the Covenant, right? That box. And then the lid of that box, the mercy seat or the atonement cover, in the New Testament, it's also translated propitiation by the blood of Jesus. So very important symbol. We, we looked at Romans like 325. It says, whom God set forth as a propitiation by his blood. That is the same Greek word used 
right here in Exodus 25. It's being translated as mercy seat here, but it's translated in, in the New Testament as propitiation. So you could, you could call this the seat of propitiation in his blood. But that's what it says. Or in the New Testament, you could make a note in your Bibles under Romans 3.25 that uh, he set forth his son to be the, the, the mercy seat in his blood. So he is the mercy seat, and then the blood is placed on the mercy seat by the high priest, Jesus. The same word uh, that's used here in, in the Greek Septuagint in, in Exodus 25 is also in Hebrews 9, 5. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. So he says the mystery of the depth of how powerful of a picture of, of the work of Christ is built into that Ark of the Covenant. He said it would take a lot of, a lot of pages uh, to, to go into detail. So I'm just going to mention it and go on. There's another word, same thing, mercy seat. It's also in the Old Testament. It's not here. It is found in Leviticus and Numbers and elsewhere in the Old Testament. It's a different Greek word, and it's also translated mercy seat or propitiation. And we find it twice in the New Testament. In 1 John 2.2, 2, he himself is the propitiation, or he is the mercy seat for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the whole world. In 1 John 4.10, and this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, again, the mercy seat or the propitiation for our sins. So last time, the question came up. I don't know if it's on the tape, but in our question and answer time afterwards was, you know, how did they move these things? And I said, it's actually quite an elaborate thing. We're going to go into detail uh, into it. And then when we actually see them move it, it's going to be quite an elaborate thing. But I, I answered it quickly. Uh, but understand, there were three sons of Levi. And make a long story short, in just a couple of chapters, the golden calf, you guys remember that Aaron made? Well, Moses said, hey, we're going to have, we got to stop this. We got to repent. The people didn't want to stop. And Moses drew a line and said, everybody who's for the Lord, get on this side of the line. You're, we're going to fight. And only the tribe of Levi came. And then they had a war. 3,000 people died. But remember at that point, Moses actually said, God is going to put a blessing upon you for standing on the Lord's side today. So God's original plan, it seems to be, was that the people were to tithe 10% of each of the men in their tribe to be a priest. So 10% of each of the 12 tribes would have a priest. A percentage of their people would be priest for their tribe. But because of this incident, that plan was scrapped. And now just one of the children of Jacob was chosen and his children would be the priest and that would be the Levites. And so he had three main sons, uh, Koath, Gershon, and Merari. And so these became the three branches of the priesthood. The Koathites, which is the most holy that's of, the, of Aaron and his children, and then the Gershonites, and then the Merariites. And we're, we're going to see in that. A lot of people, they, they hear this for the first time, they're like, eh, I don't think that's in the Bible. I've never heard of Merari anywhere. It's in there, trust me. Um, <laughs> the Mar Merari and the Merariites is in there. Um, as a matter of fact, you can look it up. In Numbers chapter 4, the Kohathite's job was taking care of the most holy things. And again, they could never look on them. They could, they had to, they, they could not touch it. They could only touch the poles, remember, of carrying the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread, and other holy items. For example, they had different tools and stuff that they used with these things. 
The Gershonites in Numbers 4, again, uh, they were responsible for the curtains. There were lots of them. They were very thick, very heavy. And the ropes and the coverings, that was their portion to take care of, to set up, break down, carry. And then the Merariites, their task was maintaining and carrying from place to place the pillars. That, that's like a big column, unless you're from the south, and it's a big fluffy pillar for sleeping on. But it's not the fluffy one, it's the, 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 the heavy one. And then the bases, the frames, the pegs, the cords, all the things that held up the tent and the wall around the tent were those things. So that was a question that came up last time, and I thought, okay, I'll go ahead and, and, and you know, evolve that a little bit bigger for those who had that questions, and we'll see it later on. Good question. Well, so tonight we pick up here in verse 23, and reading verse 23 to 29, we look at the table of showbread. You shall also make a table of acacia wood. We're familiar with that, right? That's what the ark was made out of. Uh, very hard wood there in the desert. Uh, bugs don't like to eat it. Um, it. It was two cubits shall be its length, and a cubit its width, and a cubit and a half its height. So when you really think about it, it's a little bit smaller, but very similar to the shape of the Ark of the Covenant. Okay? Do we have a picture up there? Yes, we do. And you shall overlay it with pure gold and make a molding of gold all around, and you shall make it for a frame of the handbreadth of all around, and you shall make a gold molding of the frame all around, and you shall make for it four rings of gold and put the rings on the four corners that are at its four legs. And the rings shall be close to the frame and the holders for the poles to the bear the table. And you shall make the poles of acacia wood and overlay them with Gold and the table will be carried with them. And you shall make as dishes, as pans, as pitchers, as bowls for pouring. You shall make them of pure gold. So it's a table. It's got the pans. It's got the pitchers. It's got the bowls. It's a table with bread upon it. And it's 36 inches in its length, three feet. And then it's 18 inches wide, one and a half feet, and then 21 inches high. So it literally is basically the size of a piano bench. If you think of a piano bench, you're coming very, very close. A little smaller than the Ark of the Covenant, but very close. And the same thing, the rods going through it. So again, it would be covered up backwards, the sheet laid over it. The poles would be... Uh, only thing that the priest would pick up and, and carry uh, in the touching of that because it's a holy thing. Now, it's interesting here that we, we again, we, we don't have any pictures of this, uh, our drawings of this. Um, what we do is have the description, and of course, a person can listen to that description, and it's a pretty vague description because you say there's a frame around it. Well, what does that frame look like? You, you can get an infinite amount of ideas. So that's what people have done. That's why you have very many different things that look. But interesting enough, when Titus, the Roman general in 70 AD, conquered Jerusalem, he carried back some items. And with that, they made a giant arch, the Arch of Titus, we call it today in Rome, that actually has these things carved in it. So we actually have a little bit better of a picture. And so we can look at some of those pictures. There's the, the arch. And there's another view. There's, that's what you would see. It's not very clear today. But if you were to see it clearly, it would look more like that. <laughs> that's what it would have looked more like, what they actually had. So... The word frame here is the word borders, so the borders or the fastenings, the rim around it. We have a video like we did last week that comes off of YouTube. Some people ask me about the details of it. I, it's, it's in the email I sent out to everybody, so you can click on the email uh, at home and, and look at that. But um, here's what it looks like. Good stuff. Go for it.
Thou shalt also make a table of shittim wood. Two cubits shall be the length thereof, and a cubit the breadth thereof, and a cubit and a half the height thereof. And thou shalt overlay it with pure gold, and make thereto a crown of gold round about. And thou shalt make unto it a border of an hand breadth round about, and thou shalt make a golden crown to the border thereof round about. And thou shalt make for it four rings of gold, and put the rings in the four corners that are on the four feet thereof. Over against the border shall the rings be for the places of the staves, to bear the table. And thou shalt make the staves of shittim wood, and overlay them with gold, that the table may be borne with them. And thou shalt make the dishes thereof, and the spoons thereof, and covers thereof, and bowls thereof, to cover with all, of pure gold shalt thou make them. And thou shalt set upon the table showbread before me always. Okay. So hopefully that visualized you as much as uh, can be. Now the, the, in verse 30 here, it says, And you shall set the showbread on the table before me always. Now this helps us. Because the word showbread here is, is actually the word bread, lechem. Remember Beth, lechem, house of bread? That's all this is here is lech. And then we have before me. So uh, the, the Hebrew word uh, panam, so lechem panam, bread, literally it is before my face. The bread that's before my face or in my presence or before God. So you're at the table of God. You're before the face of God. It's, again, you'd be facing the curtain, and behind that curtain is the Ark of the Covenant. And you're eating this bread in the presence of God or before God's face. Later on, it's going to say, and Moses talked to one face to face. Talk to God as one face to face. And so this is a concept that they had that you're, you're not just eating some bread, but you're in the presence of God as you're eating this bread. And that's why it's called show bread. Now we do have some more specifics on this in Leviticus 24 verse 5 through 9. <clears throat> and you shall take the fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two tenths of an ephrah shall be in each cake. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, and the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row, that it may be on the bread for a memorial and offering made by fire to the Lord. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. And it shall be for Aaron and his sons that they shall eat in the holy place, for in it most holy to him from the offering of the Lord made by fire by a perpetual statute. So in other words, while they're in there doing the work, if they get hungry, they just grab some bread and they eat it. They have some uh, a pitcher there. They drink some water. There's some frankincense burning, incense going off, probably keeping the flies away and bugs and stuff away from it, but also giving uh, in the tent uh, and the later the, 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 te the temple itself a, a beautiful incense and frankincense. But to get an idea, this is, this is a lot of bread. It's something close to four quarters of flour uh, in each loaf of bread. So each loaf of bread is about six pounds. And then there's 12 of those loaves. So six times 12, that's 72 pounds of bread. And then you got the frankincense. And then every Sabbath or Saturday, they would replace it with new bread. And the old bread would be taken home to the priests and their families. They could eat it. It didn't have to be wasted. Now, remember last time we, we looked at this in Hebrews 8, <clears throat> chapter 8, verse 5. Who served the 
These things all served as a copy or a shadow of the heavenly things. <coughs> and Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all these things according to the pattern shown you in the mountain. So Moses saw this, this heavenly picture. And so we, we have this the, the very skeleton outline of it being described here. But later, we're going to see Moses describing it to these artisans. The Holy Spirit comes on these artisans. And then Moses is able to communicate to this, and they're able to, to replicate that heavenly scene. So what do we have in heaven, this table of showbread? We know, for example, in Revelation 19.9, it says, Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. When we are raptured, we go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he who said this to me, these are true sayings of God. So it is in the table of the Lord. So what, what are the possibilities of a picture of heaven that this is to give us? Well, one, some people say this is a picture of the fellowship of God with his people, Israel. That's why there's 12 loaves representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And so it is sort of a picture in heaven where the, all the people that are resurrected and raptured and caught up and those who have passed away are with the Lord. They're all eating um, as the 12 tribes of Israel with the Lord. Another one is as a picture of communion. And uh, that could be, but, but typically... Um, we think of manna as communion because Jesus in, in John 6 really went into manna as his body that we eat, that bread. But maybe it's both. Maybe the, the manna is a representative of the body of Christ that we eat, and, and so is the table of showbread. It is also representing the body of Christ that we eat. It could be both. Most believe that the table itself is a picture of Christ. It's through him and his provisions that we can be before the face of God and that we can fellowship and eat with him. Remember, Jesus said, I knock on the door. If any man opens that door, I'll come in and sup with him and eat with him. Now, last week I was trying to decide, do I go into the story uh, about the Ark of the Covenant with, Dave, with David and Usa and all of that, and, and afterwards it ended up getting discussed. So I said, okay, there is a, time, there is a story in the Bible about the table of showbread as well. You guys remember this story when David's on the run from Saul, found in 1 Samuel 21? And as he's fleeing, he comes to the location where the tabernacle was setting at that time. And the, the tabernacle moved, and even after Israel was in the promised land, it had a couple different locations. And this was a particular location, typically on a hill, and it would end up becoming pretty much of a town and a city surrounding with all the families of priests and others uh, as well. So it ended up becoming a pretty good-sized community, but yet usually they put it on a hill so they could see it. So David's fleeing from Saul, and so he goes into this community where the tabernacle is, and, and he tells the high priest a big lie, that he's on a mission for Saul, and it was a secret mission, and they don't have time to get supplies. Do they have any food? Assuming they would have food, and the, and the priest happens and says, we don't. You've really caught us off guard. Uh, we don't have any food to give you. The only food that's on hand is the table of showbread which evidently they were getting ready to replace, which goes out for the priest. And, and, he, said, and he said, well, then give it to me. And he goes, well, have, have, are basically are the guys clean? Have they, when's the last time they slept with women? Are they ceremonial clean? When a Jew would go to give an offering, he had to be ceremonially clean. And he basically says, yeah, they, they would pass as ceremonial and clean if they were to give an offering. So he goes, well, okay, I'll, I'll guess that counts. <laughs> it totally didn't. Okay, in Leviticus, it makes it clear that this bread was for Aaron and his sons in Leviticus 24, 9. But that's it. You know, David's a hero. 
a little faux pas. Let's just sort of, it's gone. It's over. The story's done with. Let's forget about it. But then in the New Testament, the Pharisees, remember, had laws that superseded the Bible. The Bible said don't harvest, but the, in the Pharisees' law, they said you can't even pick one piece of fruit, which that's something they made up because that wasn't harvesting. But in the Levitical law, they said if you look in a mirror and pull a gray hair, you're harvesting. So um, they, they had these ridiculous laws. So the apostles were walking through a grain field, which had always been, not in the Pharisee law, but according, according to the life of Israel, they picked a piece of grain and they could rub it in their hands. The outer shell falls out and they could eat the inner. Even though it wasn't dry and, and ready, it would be gummy and they could chew it up and get some kind of satisfaction from it. And this is what they were doing. And the Pharisees pointed out going, your apostles are breaking law. How, what kind of rabbi are you uh, when they're doing that? Now, Jesus could have argued with them going, well, that's in your stupid uh, Pharisee law. That's not in the Bible. But he, he doesn't. He just... Try to, tries to mess him up by telling the story of, of David. And in Matthew chapter 2, he actually says to them, well, tell me about what, what it is when David went in and ate and took the bread that only the priest were to have. You know, basically, was that sin or not sin? Because clearly David was breaking the law. But in the telling of the story by the Jews, because David was such a big hero, nobody ever considered it a sin <laughs> because David was a hero. He was a celebrity. Celebrities don't have to keep the laws, right? And uh, But clearly they had broken the law. The apostles had not broken the law, but yet they're not, they're not willing to condemn David who did break the law but they are willing to condemn Jesus' apostles who didn't break the law. So he says, if you're willing to look past David and him eating the showbread, why is it such a hard thing for you to look past my apostles eating a few little pieces of uh, wheat? They're, they're picking off uh, the grains. And of course, this was stumping these Pharisees. It was a, a big challenge for them. Uh, and of course, Jesus goes on and says, God desires mercy and compassion, not, not the law, not sacrifice. Well, going on in verse 31 to 36, we now are going to look at the lampstand. You shall also make a lampstand of pure gold. A lampstand shall be of Hammered work, its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornaments, its knobs, its flowers shall be of one piece. Remember, the mercy seat was like that. It was one continuous piece of gold. It wasn't pieces, you know, where you, you had the male and female part and you soldered it together. No, it was one continual piece, which would be amazing, difficult. In verse 32, the six branches shall come out of its sides, Three branches of the lampstand out of the side, and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with the ornamental knob and a flower, and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like uh, almond blossoms, each with its ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, a knob under the third branches of the same, according to the six branches that are extended for the lampstand. Their knob and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be of one hammered piece of pure gold. And so this lampstand. Now, I will say this. The King James translates it as candlestick. And that would be incorrect because it is not candles. Now, I know we have a menorah. Sometimes you see a menorah of eight 
because that's a Hanukkah candle. That's a different story. And there's candles in the top of them. So a lot of people have menorahs that have candles, and they assume that was what's in the temple. No, there was no candles. There were wicks, but it was oil in the arms. Okay, so to translate a candlestick would very much be incorrect. It was a lampstand. Oil was used, not wax. Now, the actual Hebrew word here is menorah. So often we think of a modern day menorah. That's correct. That's the correct shape. But it's not candlesticks, not candles in the top. That's the difference. So when we say menorah, we usually think candles in the top. Incorrect, if that's your thought. But if you think of the shape of the menorah, it's the same. It's very correct. So in the middle shaft, there are three branches that come out of each side. So a total of seven, right? And um, with this comes the, the various designs of the almond blossoms. The almond blossoms is the first tree to bud in the springtime. And it's, it's a picture of life and freshness and, and the life-giving uh, of the, the springtime. Once again, we have this in Adrian's arch or the arch of Titus in Rome. There was also a picture of the menorah. And uh, there's several various pictures of that as well. And then we also, along with this, have a video. You should also make a lampstand of pure gold. The lampstand shall be of hammered work. Its shaft, its branches, its bowls, its ornamental knobs and flowers shall be of one piece. And six branches shall come out of its sides. Three branches of the lampstand out of one side and three branches of the lampstand out of the other side. Three bowls shall be made like almond blossoms on one branch with an ornamental knob and a flower and three bowls made like almond blossoms on the other branch with an ornamental knob and a flower, and so for the six branches that come out of the lampstand. On the lampstand itself, four bowls shall be made like almond blossoms, each with an ornamental knob and flower. And there shall be a knob under the first two branches of the same, a knob under the second two branches of the same, and a knob under the third two branches of the same according to the six branches that extend from the lampstand. Their knobs and their branches shall be of one piece. All of it shall be of one hammered piece of pure gold. You shall make seven lamps for it, and they shall arrange its lamps so that they give light in front of it. And its wick trimmers and their trays shall be of pure gold and it shall be made of a talent of pure gold with all these utensils. And see to it that you make them according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. There's, in Israel, there's called the Temple Institute, and they've tried to get everything, all the utensils, everything made, ready for a new temple that will be built one day. And if you want to go in there, it's, it's interesting the first time. When you've been on several trips and you do it again and again, it can get a little, little bit monotonous, as you can see, because these guys are going to go into every little detail for you and point them out. And if you're interested enough, it's interesting, but when you've been touring for, you know, 10 days, and now you're setting, every time you sit down, it's, you want to fall asleep. So it's, it can get a little hard when you get to Israel. But the size of this one piece of continuous gold is um, about the size of a human. It's about the size of a man. So it's huge. And um, it'd be millions of dollars. They say a talent is um, about 79 pounds. So um, you can imagine how, or 75 pounds is a, the weight of a talent. So you can imagine how much this would, would have. Now, a question that might come up later, I'll go ahead and answer now. 
We're going to see here in a couple of chapters in Exodus chapter 27, verse 20, as well as in Leviticus 24, verse 2 and 3. It says, this candle shall burn continually. So some are very hard fast, great, preach great sermons, how this never went out. Even when they traveled, it never went out. And I believed that for quite a while. But when I looked into it this time around, I, I, I noticed that in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 2 and 3, it says that this lamp is to burn continually. But then he says, this is for Aaron and his sons from evening till morning. They're to do this. And then in another place, it does talk about how they clean it out. They take out the wicks and put in new wicks with new oil and so forth. So it's not burning during the, the working on it time, which is in the early every morning. So every morning after a night, they're to take it apart and get it all ready for the following evening. But in that tent, there would be no light. I mean, they could keep the door open a crack uh, and let some daylight come in. Maybe that's the way it worked. Or maybe there was little holes in the, the different rivets and stuff in the tent. And so there was some little beams of light coming through. But some say, no, there was no light except for this menorah. And others say, no. So I don't know the answer. There you go. Um, <laughs> so you don't need to ask it now. But what about this lampstand in heaven? Well, in Revelation 1, verse 12 and 13, it says, Then I turned to see the voice that spoke to me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands was one like the Son of Man. So in the midst of the lampstand itself was Jesus. And in verse 20 of chapter 1 of Revelation, And the mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So, what do these represent? In one case, they say they represent the seven churches. And then in chapter 4 of Revelation, verse 5, And from the throne proceeding lightning, thunderings, and voices, seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God, or the Spirit of God. Interesting in Zechariah, chapter 4. Now, you know this chapter because it has one of the most famous verses in the Bible. This is where God says to him, do you know what this means? And Zechariah said, no. And he said, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. Now, what was the vision that Zechariah had before he made that statement? Before God told him that? He saw in this vision, this, this lampstand. But it was different. The lampstand had pipes coming from every, all seven of them, and each of the pipes went actually into its own olive tree. <laughs> and so from the olive tree, it was continually getting oil in each seven trees with seven pipes into the seven candles, and there was no need for man to do, have anything to do with it. And he said, do you know what this means? And he said, no. And he said, it's not by might nor by power, but it's by my spirit. I don't need man to be the one to put the oil in. And of course, what was he talking about? He was talking about the building of the temple, that they just come from back Babylon and the people were unwilling to build. And he said, hey, speak to that mountain, grace, grace. Speak grace to it and it'll become a plain. So I'm going to make it happen. It seems impossible that you're going to get this temple built but I'm going to make it happen through the power of my spirit alone. Even though man could be involved in it, I'm going to surpass man in getting this accomplished. Great, powerful, wonderful verse. So whether it's the seven churches or the seven, it's talking about the spirit of God and it's, it's the oil. You know, the oil often is the Holy Spirit and, and the spirit filling the place with its presence. We really don't know. Jesus said plainly in John 8, 12, I am the light of the world. And then he passed that baton on to his disciples saying, 
I'm no longer in the world. Now you're going to be the light of the world. But interesting, Jesus has something to say on this in Matthew 5, verse 14 to 16. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So here is saying, you, I, we both are the light. When I'm in the world, I'm the light of the world. Now, I'm not going to be the world. You're in the world. You are the light of the world. Be a light like I'm a light. And you're going to have to work at it. It's not going to happen without effort. It can easily get put under a bushel or stuck under a bed. It, it can, it can, uh, it needs oil, it needs tendering, it needs caring in order for this light to be what it was supposed to be. It's, it's not going to happen without you tending to it. So in application, we are the priest, right? Revelation 1.6, you are the priest of God, the kings and priests of God. So in the morning, they had duties. In the evening, they had duties. They had the cleaning duties. They had the making sure there's fresh oil in the lamp. I thought about putting that song in there tonight. Keep oil in my lamp. Keep me burning, burning, burning. Me oil in my lamp. Anyway, we shall be, we need to be the light in the midst of a dark world. What's that look like? Ephesians chapter 5. I don't have time to read it tonight. Our time's up. But there you go. If you read Ephesians chapter 5, those 33 verses... I think it is a perfect description of as New Testament priest, how we are to make sure the oil's in the lamp and the lamp keeps burning. Paul talks about that and he actually uses some of that exact imagery in this passage that we're to be wise, not unwise. Um, we're not to let us be like the world but be filled with the spirit, he says. And, and we're to be, have the spirit flowing and it's to be a light. We're to speak to one another. And, and, and all these worldly sinful things, fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, all these things that people are deceiving each other that we don't need to live a holy life. He says you absolutely need to live in the light and have no darkness at all. And you want to continue to do, be wise about this because the days are evil and everything's going against you to darken you and to keep that light from shining. But you need to, to, to maintain that fresh life in the Lord so you have a fresh shining, fresh oil. I, I, later we will go into how the oil and the kind of oil, but it was the top grade oil that took a lot of pounding, a lot of, a lot of work. To, to have this quality of oil that was used in the temple. Well, we'll end there. And do we have some questions?